we're having a collective psychosis of titanic proportions in which our species, we're killing ourselves, we're killing, we're destroying the biosphere, the life support system of the planet. This reality that we all are sharing right now is of the nature of some sort of collective dream. We're all dreaming each other up. When somebody's going through an experience like that, it's like um, your your psyche is, is disintegrating towards potentially a higher integration in a way almost like your inner constitution is getting like rewritten and you're in a fragile, very vulnerable state. I had tapped into this incredible energy and um, that wasn't a personal energy and I was in the process of integrating it, but I wasn't in a container. I wasn't in an ashram, a monastery, or anything like that. And so I wasn't skillful at being able to creatively express it in a way that wouldn't freak people out. Because it was so creative, and I was feeling so unbelievably creative, like I was on the cutting edge of like the Big Bang itself. The Watiko virus, it's an indigenous Native American term, um, the Cree Indians would be their term, and it would, it would con out this, this evil spirit, this cannibalistic spirit, and it's, the more I studied it, the more I understood, oh my god, this is completely mind-blowingly profound. So it's nothing that I discovered, all I'm doing is translating this indigenous wisdom into a modern psychological idiom. The thing with Watiko is that, or this evil spirit that's informing what's playing out, is that the origin of it is the psyche. Okay? The origin of it is the collective unconscious, which we all share. And it is, you know, I don't know what are the words used, it is the trippiest phenomena because its source is in the psyche, and it synchronistically explicates itself through the medium of the outside world, which is to say that it's as if this virus that is in the collective unconscious itself somehow extends itself out into the world and actually configures seemingly outer events so as to synchronistically express something that's happening inside of us. So this Watiko virus, it's not an objectively existing virus. It's not something that oh, we have to be afraid of. In the ultimate sense, it doesn't even exist. It has no intrinsic independent existence at all, and yet it can destroy our species. The way the Watiko virus works when we're unaware of it, we then unwittingly become an instrument through which it acts itself out in life. And simultaneously while doing that, it hides itself from being seen. It can only work and, and operate in its sinister ways when we don't see it. When we see it, it has no power, and not only when we see it, it has no power, but then we become empowered. Okay? Another way of understanding Watiko, it's like who we are are these geniuses. We are geniuses as far as how we co-create reality. The Watiko bug co-ops our genius and turns it against us in such a way that we create a reality that not only is not serving us, but is killing us. The thing about Watiko, it's a, a virus of the mind, but unlike a typical, like a typical virus will mutate when you create, you know, when you have new antibiotics to try to kill it. Well, the Watiko virus won't mutate, it forces us to mutate. The Watiko virus, it operates through the psyche, through our unconscious blind spot, in such a way that it works 
through the projective tendencies of our mind, because we're always projecting, we're always connecting the dots on the waking ink blot to create our particular experience. And then we'll have a meaning in our experience. But the way it'll work is that, so the Watiko virus will operate through the projective tendencies of our mind in such a way that then we perceive reality and then think that it objectively exists separate from us which we then react to, thinking that we're reacting to reality when we're actually reacting to our own projection, our own mind. The thing about the Watiko spirit, this evil spirit whose origin is the psyche, so it's, it's an actual dis-ease of, it's a psycho-spiritual dis-ease of the soul. And one way of understanding it, it's a form of like, of blindness. Okay, now Watiko virus, it's not only a form of, of psychic of being blind, but it's a blindness that believes that it's sighted, and it arrogantly believes not only that it's sighted, but that it's more sighted than anyone else. What's happening in the world is an actual reflection of what's happening inside of us. And when you begin to see that, and if you just step back for a moment, what I just described, that's like a dream. Because what is a dream? A dream is a reflection of the dreamer. When you're in a dream, in a night dream, right? If you have a particular viewpoint in that night dream, the night dream has no choice but to instantaneously shapeshift and reflect back to you your viewpoint. Because what is the night dream but your own mind, right? And if you think about that, so if you change your viewpoint in that night dream, the night dream has no choice but to spontaneously shapeshift and reflect back your change in perspective. So, if we're split off from a part of ourselves, say if we're split off from our own evil, and then of course, what do we do? We, our, our shadow, our evil, we just project outside of ourselves. And you know, going back to that dream, which is none other than our own mind, into the dream will will come, will walk somebody or a group or a nation or whoever who will embody and incarnate and carry our projection. And now we have evidence. Oh, now the darkness is really outside of myself, so we become even more entrenched in the viewpoint that the evil is outside of ourselves. And the more we do that, the more the evil in the dream will appear very convincingly as evidence that it really is outside of ourselves. And it becomes a self-perpetuating feedback loop, which if we don't see through it, we then unwittingly become an instrument for the propagation of the Watiko virus. One of the main conclusions in the book is that encoded in the evil of Watiko is not only its own antidote, but is a blessing. That it's actually helping us to wake up. That it's showing us something. That as we get taken over by it, and we get taken over by it whenever any of us falls into our unconscious and acts out our unconscious, or acts out compulsively, or our habitual patterns, or addictions, we're actually at that point agents for Watiko. And yet, encoded in our acting out the unconscious, something is being revealed to us through that. And so everything depends on if we have the recognition of what's being shown to us, okay? It's very quantum in the sense that, think about what is the nature, like if you contemplate light, and quantum physicists have discovered, oh wow, under certain circumstances, light will manifest as a particle. Other circumstances, it'll manifest as this wave. It depends how you observe it. And they've discovered, oh, from that point of view, this world we live in, it makes no sense at all to talk about this world as having any objective existence whatsoever as separate from the observer in the same way that it makes no sense at all to talk about the observer separate from this world. The observer is the observed. And so, um, 
the Watiko virus is quantum in that is it destroying our species or is it waking us up? It depends how we dream it. It's a dreamed up phenomenon, okay? And um, everything depends if we have the recognition of what it's showing us. Almost like homeopathy, you have to take in something in yourself to, to have, find the cure because the evil we're seeing out in the world when I say that Watiko is a synchronistic, um, it operates synchronistically collapsing the boundary between the inner and the outer, the evil we see in the world is actually a reflection of the evil that exists in us. And if we get too entranced in trying to destroy the evil out there and projecting our shadow and trying to destroy the, that darkness as it manifests in the world, we then become possessed by that very evil. One of the things that Watiko is showing us is our own darkness, our own evil. And one other thing Watiko is showing us is that, you see, you can't see Watiko at all. It's, it's invisible as long as we're identified with a separate self, with an isolated, alienated, skin-encapsulated, egoic self that exists separate from anybody else. And that's, you know, that's a lot of our almost habitual, typical identity pattern is to identify ourselves as being an ego. But when you have the viewpoint of that separate self, you can't see Watiko. It makes no sense at all. In physics, they talk about the field, the non-local field, and, and that word um, not being local, non-local, it's a physics term which means that the third dimensional laws of space and time are transcended, they don't hold. And this physics has discovered that this world we live in is non-local. The implication is there's no separation anywhere, that everything is connected with everything else. So if we think, oh, that person, that bad guy, that terrorist, that whoever, fill in the blank, that they're evil, if we hold that viewpoint, we've then fallen under the spell of Watiko because Watiko feeds off of not only fear but polarization. If we think that the evil is outside of us or if we concretize somebody as being evil, that's the way Watiko is hiding through our perception. So when I say you can't see Watiko if you're identified with the separate self, you actually begin to see Watiko when you begin to recognize the non-local field that's underlying and informing and synchronistically pervading all of reality. And when you see that non-local field, that's to begin to discover the dreamlike nature of reality because you begin to realize we don't exist in isolation, but we exist, we're interconnected and interdependent with each other. And the others that we're interconnected and interdependent with, they don't exist as an, as an actual isolated, independent, separate entity, but they exist in relation to other interdependent, interconnected people. We all exist in this web of this, this reciprocal, this mutual interrelationship, interdependence, interconnection. When you see that, that's to snap out of the separate self and the expression of that realization is compassion. So compassion is the Watiko dissolver par excellence. From one point of view, we wouldn't have had these realizations without Watiko. That it was the very stimulant that's prodding us, that's inspiring us to actually cultivate our compassion and to wake up and to discover who we are. So then all of a sudden you begin to realize, wait, I thought Watiko was like the darkest evil. Well, it is. And yet it's bringing about the highest good. Well, it does. Well, I thought good and evil were total opposites. Well, from one point of view they are, because I noticed over the course of my life that there's this process that happens when there's some sort of abuse that happens in the field some sort of darkness that's manifesting, the field will configure in a way to protect the abuser. I mean, we can, there are numerous examples, think about the Catholic Church or the Boy Scouts or Penn State, you know, on and on. It's that same deeper process. So I'm not interested in, in concretizing anybody as being evil. I'm just pointing out there's a deeper archetypal process, a higher dimensional process, and this is the realm of Watiko that is formless, it's invisible, and yet it actually will manifest in the realm of form.
I would say to them that unwittingly, with the best of intentions, you are being a conduit for the evil of Watiko to play out in your avoidance. Because Watiko plays out through our blindness, through our looking away. When you see the way Watiko operates through your own psyche, through the non-local field, through inner relationships with each other, it has no power. It just will dissolve into the emptiness out of which it arose. Ultimately, it doesn't exist. And if we don't have the recognition of what it's showing us, it's going to kill us. It's like, it's like this lethal mirage, which actually doesn't exist, but can literally kill us. So one of the things that I'm trying to get across in the book is to introduce the word Watiko into just our vocabulary that we actually begin, because you know, in mythology, one way of describing Watiko, it's like a demon. And a demon, psychologically, Jung calls it an autonomous complex. It's a part of our psyche that's split off and seems to have an autonomy, an independent will or life of its own, but it's actually ultimately part of us that we're not associated with, that we've split off. So an autonomous complex is a demon, or well, in mythology, they talk about that, well, how do you, what do you do with demons? You find its name. You have to find its right name, its proper name. <laughs> and when you find its name, you take away its power. So that's one of the things I'm trying to do um, through this book. Because what I'm pointing out is that, in, and then I, I just want to invoke, as we get closer to closing, the, the divine creative imagination. Because it's through the imagination that Watiko works, and it's through the imagination that it actually gets healed. So, um, if we can imagine for a second, just imagine that you're in a dream at night, okay? And in an, in an ordinary dream, you typically don't know, unless you're really fortunate, that you're dreaming. You actually think it's real, you think the environment is objective and solid, and that you exist as the dream ego. In the dream, that's who you're imagining you are. And, um, but say something happens in the dream that actually helps you to recognize the nature of your situation, that is that you're dreaming and you, you, have, you wake up in that dream. Not out of the dream, but you wake up in the dream and you have the lucidity of like, oh my God, now I recognize the nature of my situation, I'm dreaming. And, and what have you had the recognition of? Is that, oh, who you've been imagining you are, the dream ego, this limited ego in the dream is not who you are, that's just a model for who you are. That's just who, who you actually are is the dreamer of the dream. And you realize the dreamer of the dream is not separate from the whole dream. And all of a sudden you realize, well, all of the dream characters in that dream, they're parts of you. And you know, and that's where the compassion comes in, right? But let's let's invoke that imagination once more. Now imagine you have that experience in a night dream that you recognize you're dreaming. You have lucidity. And then imagine you connect with another dream character in that dream who's also realizing that they're dreaming. And they also recognize that what they're experiencing is just their own energy, their own mind, that they're not out of their mind, but they're inside their mind, okay? Now, imagine not just two people, but what would you imagine would happen if there were 10 or 100 or 500 people in that night dream who all were having that lucidity and all connecting with each other and putting their realization together and contemplating what they're realizing. Oh my God. This is all a dream. This is a mass shared dream. The way it's manifesting is a function of how we dream it. It's nothing other than our own consciousness materialized into form. Okay? And I would, I would then suggest that in that imagination, that those dreamers who are awakening to the nature of their situation could discover that they could change the dream. 
particularly when they put what I call their sacred power of dreaming together. Now, that was just a description of a night dream. And what I'm suggesting in the book, and I go into this during a lot of the second half of the book, is that what I just described is actually the nature of our situation right now in the waking dream, that as more and more of us wake up, we can connect with each other through that open heart of lucidity and compassion where we recognize we're not separate, and we could, it's what I call conspire to co-inspire. It's a true conspiracy theory. <laughs> and we can dream ourselves awake. And this is an evolutionary impulse offered to us by the universe that we're invited to partake. <laughs>